This sticker podcast is coming to you from the Citadel Securities Trading Post on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Hi, everyone. Last month, a conclave of the nation's top business bosses announced a fundamental change in direction for U.S. style corporate capitalism. What they said was shareholder value would no longer drive their decisions. What, what, what? So, who can better give guidance to their hesitation or inform their ignorance? As it turns out, stakeholders. And that's a seismic shift. For one thing, it's an appropriation of great power and responsibility. Let's put a pin in that. It also means a wholesale change in the investor relations conversation. From now on, basically, it's not so much about the numbers. And with probably a lot more coordination, that conversation will be conducted with a much broader audience. For years and years, the purpose of the public corporations was largely to make profit. Uh, And the key uh, constituent in that audience was the shareholder. And so you heard constantly... Louis Shulow is Executive Director, Head of Financial Services at Landor. Landor specializes in helping companies find their purpose and using brand and design to drive business transformation. So from a branding perspective, we see a lot of companies who have incredible brands out in the marketplace now wanting to supplement that brand or elevate the brand with a purpose. And that's a purpose beyond making money. So, a new purpose. A purpose that transcends mere profit. On this Ticker Podcast, the brand is back. How the right brand story can embody that purpose, instill confidence, and heck, maybe even drive a little shareholder value. Every purpose needs a story, don't it? I think you'll really enjoy this one. Louis Solo, welcome to the ticker. Thank you. Nice to be here. Louis, what is branding? Branding um, has a lot of interpretations, but it is the essence of a company. And what are the elements of communicating that essence or even defining that essence? It's a set of assets, your name, your purpose, your strategy, Uh, your mission, the behaviors of the people that work for the company, um, its impact on the community and the places that it works in, its visual identity, its voice. And what's the purpose of branding? It's to create an identity and to create distinction between companies. And in today's market, I guess that distinction is becoming more and more important. Companies have always been looking for differentiation, right? When, when there is a choice to be made between two things, what is the decision based on? And there's very few things that are unique and singular anymore in the marketplace. And so Landor was is over 75 years old. Walter Landor, who was the founder, was uh, by all means the inventor of branding. So he started the firm in San Francisco on a ferry boat to avoid paying taxes, real estate taxes in San Francisco, and that was the first office for Landor. And he was somebody who was really keen on looking at how people make those choices. So he would set up, you know, supermarket shelves and watch how consumers chose one product over another. And he, there were a lot of milestones in the history of Landor and also Walter Landor. But when you just think about that notion of choice and what you make those choices based on and what flows out of that, right? What flows out of the influence that, um, the things that influence that choice, you then can start to see that, that there's an opportunity. The opportunity with regard to your business with the IR community is to, is to tell a story about that company that is memorable. So, How often do you see that? Not very often, right? What you see in that community is a lot of uh, processes around how to do this or how to do that or lots of uh, requirements around guidance and producing numbers and all of that. Very little about a story. Yet when you hear 
you know, uh, criticism coming out of the RIR community about why they're not getting better investors, why more people aren't interested in the company, it's largely based on them not understanding the story, based on the street not understanding the story. Yet what you don't see often um, is someone in the management team beyond the CEO or let's say the IRO trying to tell that story in a clear way. And I think that's a big opportunity for companies. And I think you're going to see more and more of it where events like earnings reports, investor days, conference presentations are going to need to surface that story if they're going to be distinctive. For Sholo, few firms better grasp the implications of our brave new communications paradigm than global professional consultancy Accenture. Accenture has had a pretty good run in recent years. Sholo says that's due in no small part to its ability under charismatic former CEO Pierre Nanterme to leverage its brand story, its vision, to resonate with investors. Most recently, that story has been about its digital transformation strategy. I mean digital transformation journey. We are doing to make this company uh, leading in the new and leading in the marketplace. At the time where we're starting the effort, we recognize that the technology revolution was starting to disrupt and transform companies and anti-industries globally. And so we decided to take bold strategic actions to drive our differentiation, not only to better serve uh, our clients, but also to meet our objectives. Uh, under Pierre Nanturn, Accenture really took that to a nirvana level, in my mind, where they started to control the story. The story was about the new things that they're doing. They coined a phrase around it to capture the essence of what that new vision was and the pivot that the company was making. And then the analyst community paid attention to it because it was right up in the front. I'll get to the numbers in a minute. Let me get you excited about the amazing things that we're doing. Nirvana for an IR person is to actually hear the analyst and investor community echo back your story. How often do you hear that? Not very often. You go back and look at the transcripts of those meetings under Pierre, what you're going to see is that the analysts were actually asking stories and using the vocabulary that he was putting into the marketplace about the pivot the company was making. To me, that's the opportunity we're looking at, right? It's not just, let me make it clear to you that we're buying this company because this is a vertical integration play, or I needed the geography, or I wanted their book of business, or I bought it for the talent. That's not a story. That's just a description of your business strategy and why you're doing things. A story has a lot more memorable elements to it, and it creates interest and excitement. And I don't see that around very often. So I'm just putting that out. So that's my pushback on the fact that I don't think people are crafting the story and the IR community in the way that is memorable. We'll hear more about the Accenture story again later on, but I still needed a bit more tutoring on the distinction between story and description and how and to whom the narrative would be told. Can the IR brand be different from the consumer brand or the, the sort of the corporate brand or, or does it have to be the same? Well, I mean, generally there is only one brand, right? When you, there are a lot of people handling it and the, and the story goes through different channels. I don't think that the story, I don't think it's a different story for a channel. I think it's just told in a different way. So for IR, the IR community, right? The biggest constituents have largely been um, research analysts and professional investors, right? But they don't well, care, for example, if uh, the product is fresh and consumers love the product. They, they care more about a brand where these guys have amazing electric vehicle trucks and they have a supply chain. And that's kind of the IR story. You know what I mean? I think that's been the IR story for a while simply because the main purpose that public corporations have been serving our shareholders. And so the reason that that statement on Monday... While each of our individual companies serves its own corporate purpose, we share a fundamental commitment to all of our stakeholders. was such a powerful statement, and you're seeing it on the front page of the newspapers, is because it's shifting that story to be all stakeholders. 
And that story has been kind of nascent for a couple of years anyway, right? Because people have been talking about corporate social responsibility, um, what the whether or not their business is sustainable, whether or not the board is really looking out for the long-term benefit of a company. So the, the community of stakeholders around a brand has been growing anyway. And so this move just kind of made for a moment where now people can talk about this in a way that I think is going to change the story for uh, investor relations in, overall. Because if the larger story is about what are you doing across all of these channels, there's an opportunity to tell that and weave that into how that makes your company successful. And making your company more successful means that it'll be more profitable and that will be of interest to analysts and investors around the world. And you can see that um, with the rise of ESG investing anyway, right? You can see that more and more folks are looking at opportunities to ensure that the way that they invest matches the way that they think beyond just making the money. And the fact that that has grown so significantly that now you can go and look at a list of ETF products and just about everybody who's issuing it has a sustainability ETF somewhere kind of tells you that there's a lot of interest in it. And certain big investors like pension funds, for instance, would be a good example, um, have that on their mind more because their constituents will be demanding that as well. I think this is just a time when the need for a story, an understandable, memorable story, uh, needs to come out of that, those companies. And I think that the place it should happen is with the investor relations group. In, in cooperation with the rest of the management team, right? Because they're speaking to one particular channel. I'm just suggesting that the conversation is broader than just the numbers, right? Or just the fact that if I'm a consumer brand, I just took on 10% more clients or I sold X percent more product, right? I'm just saying the story is broader now. So investors may start to want to have more information about what are you doing in the communities that you work in? What are you doing to retain your staff? What are you doing to attract the best talent? You know, not just what am I doing to keep my costs down and keep the stock price up. What's your purpose? Describe your purpose in, through story. Mm -hmm. how, how far up the uh, chain are our companies now grasping that concept? I think that there is an awareness of it. It's just compartmentalized. So there would have been a story that had to be crafted around what I'm doing in the community that I live in if I'm a big enough fish in that pond. There would have had to be a story around what am I doing to attract talent? What am I doing to create a sustainable business over time? What am I doing around environmental issues? But they've all been sort of individual stories sort of aimed at solving for the need to tell people about those efforts. I guess what I'm suggesting is that now that there's more awareness that there are other stakeholders simply beyond uh, shareholders to a company's well-being, that that story should be more inclusive of all of those things. Right. So think of it this way. I, I have ABC Corporation. I'm the biggest employer in, you know, the town that, that my company is in. I'm the primary employer. If I decide simply on a cost basis that I have to remove that, and you saw lots of these things happening uh, in the last couple of decades, that I just pulled my company out and then there are thousands of people who are unemployed. And what it does to a town like that. I grew up in Pittsburgh. When the steel mills closed, that town went down. Lots of people lost work. That was the identity for the city. Uh, it created lots of opportunities for other kind of businesses, but that took a really long time for that to happen. That was a steel town. Half of the property was named after, you know, titans of steel and in industry. There's a responsibility that some people would say comes with that to be careful about your maneuvers. And I think that that seemed to be absent for the longest time and that created a scenario where people now, a, a lot of people now think that corporations are irresponsible, 
they don't really care about their employees, they don't take care of that, it's only about profit and shareholders. Um, if that discussion now is broader, simply because a lot of CEOs and big corporations believe that there are other stakeholders that need to be considered, I think that changes the dynamic a lot. And more important, they believe that their shareholders care about those stakeholders as well and think there's something worth yeah. caring about. So just in terms of you know ordinary behavior, if I'm racing every quarter to produce numbers and my only defense is that I need the stock to go up, that makes it harder for me to do things that require some risk. If the story is about all shareholders, then I can say, well, the reason that I'm not making my numbers this quarter is because I'm investing and attracting more talent. And that's the right thing to do at this time. And then that becomes a more believable thing because I'm not just chasing after a number. I mean, let's face it, but on an earnings call, analysts can read those numbers on their own. They're not the, the way you read the number doesn't give anybody any insight into the number itself. It's the questions that come after that, right? After reading that or after hearing things. And now that AI is, is going to be, I don't know if you guys are talking about this in terms of IR, but you know, now that AI is more accessible than ever, I guarantee you that people are going to be running it on transcripts of earnings calls and looking for key words or key themes that that they can use to drive a story. And whether that's true or not, in terms of the word capturing the real strategy of the company, I don't know. But with that capability, it's gonna come a lot more scrutiny about the words. And I think that that just means that you have to be more coordinated about how you tell that story and what it is you're up to and why it's important for people to know that. So pardon my, I guess, obtuseness, but. How would you brand a conference call, practically speaking? What would be a, what would be the tools to brand a conference call? Well, again, I just point to to those calls that uh, Pierre led, which were which often um, after the disclaimer that is mandatory for a call like that, often went into sharing his excitement about what the company was doing and why it was doing it. And we'll get to the numbers in a minute. Let me just tell you, we bought blank, we did this, I'm excited about this, the reason that we're doing it is this. As with any story, right, how you open that story and how you tell it creates interest. You can open a story and say, you know, I'm down this, I'm up this, you know, I don't know, that doesn't necessarily capture my attention. I know it's, I know it's based on the fact that the people who are listening to that story um, want to understand how what you're about to say affects investments. But at the same time, they're all still humans, right? And they have to take something away that's memorable. They're not going to remember simply a list of numbers. I mean, they have that in front of them and can reference it when they write up their reviews of companies or reports on them or instruct investors on what the best options are. It's the story. That, that really will end up carrying it. So is it just a question of using sort of particular key words or just having a really enthusiastic tone from the CEO and, and the analysts go back and they say, I don't know what it is, but I, I'm just getting a good vibe from that guy. I, I think they've got a good story or, or what? Uh, I think that those are sort of tactics. I don't, I don't know that that's a replacement for having the story. I think you need the story, right? So. Take, again, just go back to the Accenture example, right? The story there was the firm is pivoting from classic sort of uh, consulting strategy to one where they want to invest in the newest things that can affect businesses now and today. And that's why the, the story was called New Applied Now. It's called what? New Applied Now. New Applied Now. And okay. also that... Every story needs a slogan? No. But it's a, it's a handy way for people to remember a larger story that contains more words. But that was largely the story, is that how, how do businesses have to pivot today, knowing that the workplace is going to change, that AI is coming into the world, all of the key sort of mostly technology-driven, exciting ideas that we hear about every day were captured by him in a phrase. 
and that phrase was called the new. And he could say to a community on the phone or at an investor presentation that this is our focus. We're focusing on the new. And when I say the new, I mean these five things. That's a very clever storytelling approach, right? Because then I can use two words to describe five concepts and people automatically understand what I'm talking about by just calling it something and naming it something. Then I can talk about how excited I am about it, how it's growing, how it's affecting the rest of the businesses, how it's becoming more and more profitable. And that's a story you can remember. And you can see if you look at those transcripts and the uh, questions that analysts would then ask of him, that they understood that and could remember it because they were asking questions about the new. Uh, and nice isn't that federal. exactly where you want to be, nice right? Federal. If I'm going to tell you, if I'm going to go out and excite you about my company and you can remember what I'm talking about and feel excited about it and think that it's something interesting, I don't know that it gets any better. And that's your ticker podcast. My thanks to Landor's Louis Sholo. So, has the rise of purpose really taken profits off the table of discussion? And if so, if shareholder primacy is no more, wither I R? Share your thoughts, preferably in voice memo form. We're at editorial at irmagazine.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Jeff Cosset. Citadel Securities is a member of FINRA and SIPC. The content of this podcast does not necessarily reflect the views of Citadel Securities.